Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Gulf Intelligence Daily Energy Markets Forum, where every day we take a reflection on where the markets have opened in Asia and where they're likely to travel during the day. It would appear uh, that we start this Wednesday morning with the markets in Asia looking uh, a little bit down, but ultimately the half full glass seems to be still very much with us. Uh, let's kick off with Vanda Nahari, founder and CEO of Vanda Insights, sitting in Singapore in the heart of the Asian markets. Vandana, good morning to you. Uh, we're still stuck around 50, but nonetheless, the equity markets seem to be hitting record after record. Good morning, Sean, and, and afternoon to, to those of our participants who are uh, more eastwards to you, shall I say. Uh, glass half full indeed. Uh, we are a uh, little bit of softening, as you say, in prices today, but uh, we're sitting quite close to the nine and 10 month highs uh, where it's settled uh, overnight. I think um, it, just the big picture, the way I see it, um, I think the oil complex has taken the fast lane to the post COVID world. Uh, I think there's no looking back. So the second part of this message may be a little bit different from what I've said previously on your show, Sean. Um, it does seem to me increasingly that the incredulity that some of us had uh, since the, uh, the, the, the very steady gradual rally began uh, in, in November, I think some, that incredulity is going to be set aside. So basically what I'm saying is uh, uh, there may be no looking back uh, that oil is uh, very firmly both feet in the post-COVID world now. Well, let's bring in David Rundell, author of Vision or Mirage, Saudi Arabia at the Crossroads, longest serving U.S. diplomat in the kingdom, as well as a on the side oil field operator in the shale patch. David, good morning. Let's kick off firstly with the Saudi budget that was announced overnight uh, as a long Saudi watcher. What do you think the health, the fiscal health of Saudi Arabia is at the end of this year, carrying a $80 billion deficit? Well, I think the first thing to note is that the so-called break-even price for Saudi Arabia on their budget is something of a myth. And I think that's an important uh, fact for people to, if they come away from this talk with it, they should understand that. That the, the first, there, there are several reasons why it's something of a, a perhaps not a myth, but it can be very misleading. It's kind of the analyst's first act reaction to the budget is always to try and calculate what's it based, what oil price is it based on. And the, reading the tea leaves in yesterday's announcement, the analysts are indicating, oh, this is around a 48 to $50 oil price that Saudi Arabia is uh, benching off. But as you say, it's a myth. Well, I mean, I think their price, that price is fairly realistic. But I would, I would point out that, that first, it's fairly obvious that the what they're really looking at is revenue, not oil price. So the volume that they produce is just as important as what the price is. So that's the first point. The, um, the second point is that their budget is uh, very flexible. It's far more flexible than, it's, let's say, the U.S. government's budget, which requires a whole series of legislation and people signing off. They have basically a king who can decide what he's going to do on any given day with their budget. So they can make dramatic changes in capital expenditure or tax policy almost overnight, which, again, most countries cannot do that. And then the final thing is that um, I have to be careful how perhaps what I say, but... Um, the budget can be very misleading in that there are many items that are not in the budget, okay? Um, the, in fact, I've had senior Saudis tell me that, that you know, the budget is somewhat of a, of, a, of a, not a fig leaf, but it's certainly not a complete a calculation of everything that they spend. Um, so um, I would say that, you know, a lot of people spend a lot of time focusing on the budget. Certainly when we were in the embassy, when I was in the embassy, we did that. But I think that um, I would take the whole thing with a grain of salt, if you want my honest opinion. I think the Saudi economy is doing better now than it has been. Um, 
And I think that they were making a lot of progress meeting some of their economic goals, like balancing the budget before COVID. And as uh, as the first speaker said, I got to make sure I say the name right, Vandana, um, that Vandana said that, you know, we're going to be on a track for a for better prices in the future, and I think that'll help them as well. Um, putting aside where the sort of predictability of the, the budget, what is the sustainability of the kingdom to manage uh, deficits of this size? You're asking Fiscal me? deficits, yeah. Well, I think they have a, a very big, um, you know, they have a very big capacity to raise debt. Um, you know, when they started Vision 2030, you know, the Saudis have really been the, the best textbook example of counter-cyclical spending, uh, you know, that, I mean, Keynes would have given them an A+. Plus. I mean, they, when they were making a lot of money and the oil prices were high, King Abdullah paid off the debt, which at one point had been over 100% of GDP, and he built up a very large cushion, which is precisely what you're supposed to do in counter-cyclical economics. In fact, he did it to such an extent that people were getting angry and saying, why aren't you spending this money? Why are you just building up this, this large nest egg? So they, when the Vision 2030 started, and then he pay, they paid down the debt, and their debt was less than 5% of GDP, which people actually said was too small. So they increased it now to about 30%. I think they have... A, agreed that they could go as high as 50%. Um, and that's still far less than most European countries or the United States. So, sure. so one, I mean, they have that capacity, I suppose. Historically, they've never used it for a bunch of different reasons. Let's bring in uh, Rustin Edwards, head of fuel yeah. oil procurement at Euronav. Um, Rustin, once again, it's always very creepy when you type on your on your computer during this call because like these ginormous <laughs> fingers coming right at you. Um, no, my, my fingers are actually that big. It goes along with my bullhorns. Yeah, exactly. The uh, we've seen the market turn overnight, principally. I mean, uh, maybe running out of steam a little bit, but ultimately the trigger being another build in inventories on the back of the API numbers. Obviously, remembering last week that huge 15 million anomaly. But uh, inventories in general building rather than declining, Rustin, what's that tell you? Well, I mean, we've got builds in the West, declines in the East. I mean, Singapore did draw down stocks for Gyra is kind of in the middle of the road. Uh, but, I mean, there is a point that uh, the big driver in the builds last week was crude oil. You know, the export numbers out of the United States fell off a cliff. Uh, I mean, the, the week prior, we were almost at 3 million a day. Then the week last week, 1.8 a day. And the imports moved up about a million and a half. So it was a big change in the dynamic of the export import numbers that really contributed to the crude oil bill that we saw in the United States last week. Um, I, I think for the most part, rack sales have been ticking up uh, despite all the bad headlines around COVID. Uh, so we have seen a marginal increase in rack sales in the United States over the last four weeks, which should point to more incipient demand that's coming in. Um, I think it's going to be an interesting tell this week to see if the market's going to discount inventory numbers or COVID vaccine going to uh, uh, trump over that. Uh, you know, Moderna, you know, they go in front of the FDA board today, uh, the immunization vaccine board, uh, for their emergency release approvals. And if that happens, then now you've got two valid vaccine candidates that are in the market. And I think the market is trading the sentiment that COVID vaccines are going to lead the way. And as uh, Vandana pointed out earlier, you know, keep the oil markets and firmly footed in a forward projector. I suppose yeah, from, uh, until uh, Vandana on that point, until such time as we start to see uh, slippage on compliance discipline, it would seem that has to be the, the big the big sort of next uh, fracture. I mean, the other thing that is interesting, and uh, it's beyond our competency, but I'll share it with what I was re studying overnight, is that there apparently is a shortage in the chemicals required to build the, the uh, Pfizer drug because the same chemicals are needed in order to do the COVID testing. And so because there's so much testing going on, the same materials are in shortage to make the actual drug. I mean, how irony upon irony. But Vandana, the compliance and OPEC discipline, the end of the year, we're starting to go with a agreed increase from January. What's your expectation there? 
So uh, compliance is important, no doubt, but uh, I have a feeling that the attention will shift and remain focused on what OPEC plus decides from month to month. So as we know, they're going to meet on the 4th of January to decide whether to pump another 500 or stay uh, flat uh, with the 500 that they are uh, boosting from January. Um, I don't think there's a chance of them uh, retreating or, or removing 500. So, so I think the possibilities are either, either staying where they are or pumping more. Um, it's interesting, I was having a, a look at um, OPEC's monthly report. And uh, since they, they calculate the expected global oil demand, uh, the expected non-OPEC output, and as a result, what is the room left for OPEC, which they call co call on OPEC oil, how much demand uh, there is for OPEC crude. Um, and just a very quick back of the envelope calculation shows that in the based on, on OPEC's outlook, in the first quarter of next year, they have room to increase by about 700,000 barrels per day totally. Uh, in the second quarter, when they see demand improving much more, uh, they have room to, to grow their output by about 1.2 million barrels per day. So give or take, the, the 2 million barrels per day that we're thinking could happen in April, if they go 500 each month, actually uh, the market will make room for that only through the first half of the year. So as the, we had the uh, Algerian energy minister, the OPEC president say yesterday, OPEC needs to be very, very cautious how much more uh, oil they put into the market. Um, and just on that point, I, I think it was uh, on, and, and it ties in with your point on compliance. Um, I was a bit amused to see the Algerian uh, minister and OPEC president say that uh, they are very, very satisfied. Those are the words he used um, with Russian compliance, which he said has been between 95 and 98% <laughs> uh, since, since the start of, of the cuts. Uh, I think UAE may not agree with that. You know, you, you might know better, Sean. So, yeah, uh, so both satisfied of is a big be, word. Yeah, so it'll be compliance. Uh, also, it will be that tussle between those training at the leash to put more oil into the market and those on, on Saudi Arabia side and saying, you know, let's be patient. David, uh, as in the introduction, we mentioned you're also a, di a diplomat, but also a, a, an oil producer in, in the shale patch in the US. I'm wondering your views at these prices moving into 2021. We're now on the back of 10 or 11 weeks of increased rig count in the US. Does OPEC underestimate the recovery power of shale at their peril? I can't comment as to, I don't know whether they are um what they think, what OPEC thinks, I can tell yeah. you what's happening in the oil patch. Yeah, and tell us what's um, happening in the oil patch. You know, what they what they make of it, um, it's up to them. Yeah, um, I mean, if just historically in the last decade, on numerous occasions, we've all <laughs> underestimated the ability of shale yes. to, and to re and recover. And I agree with that. And you know what, and that continues, okay? I mean, right now, um, I'm drilling prospects based on $45 a barrel for WTI. Uh, and, 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 it's, and that's where it is. So, you know, if it goes to 30, that would be a problem. But anything north of 45 is, is fine with us. And, uh, you know, you have to understand, and I'm sure you do understand uh, that, that um, I didn't, that sounded uh, flippant. No, no, um, no. The um, drilling costs have gone down substantially and acreage costs have gone down even more. You know, um, acreage costs in Texas are a little difficult to know because most of that is done privately. But in New Mexico, a lot of it is done through auction, which is, you know, half the Permian Basins in New Mexico or a third of it. Uh, and that there you're dealing with at state and federal land very often. So there are open auctions and you can see what the price is and prices have uh, have gone down very substantially, uh, certainly in the last six months. And they haven't really started to recover yet. So rig counts recovering. You know, in in um, in the Petroleum Club in Midland, this, the basic statement is that the solution to low prices is lower prices, and the solution to high prices is higher prices. And this is pretty much what happens. And so, is that you know, some kind of Texas mythology philosophy? White is white that, and black is black. This yeah, is no, the lovely I mean, thing well, about Texas. Everything down, is quite they simple. They keep going down. That they'll eventually go up. And, yeah, you know, of I, course. I've seen I've seen Midland, you know, when oil was twelve dollars a barrel, and I've seen it when it was uh, 
$120 a barrel. And the main difference is how many Rolls Royce dealerships there are in town. And on that, um, how does the Biden, the new Biden administration play into, does it provide a headwind to shale recovery or not, do you think? That's hard to say. That's hard. I mean, he certainly has promised that he's, you know, he's made, he, the man has made contradictory statements, okay? On the one hand, he said he's going to end fracking, then he changed his mind and he said that, you know, he wasn't going to end fracking that existed, he was just going to not allow new fracking, then he said he was only going to affect it on federal land, which wouldn't matter much in Texas, since there's very little, in fact, there's no federal land in Texas. Uh, since it used to be its own independent country, as you as you know, um, it looks so, like they want to be again by the announcement of the attorney general. Uh, well, it may happen. You never know. Uh, the uh, so um, I think that that is. I think that it's rather like his relationship with Saudi Arabia in that he said things on the campaign trail, which I, which all politicians say. This is not any criticism of. Uh, President-elect, if that's what he's called now, uh, Biden. Um, that's not what he's called. That's what he is. Well, he's no, that's not really true. Well, actually, it is as of yesterday. That's true. As, as of yesterday, yesterday, yep. As of yesterday, that's true. As of yesterday, he got um, he got elected. You're right. So even now, com even even comrade Mitch McConnell, I, de I acknowledges well, that's true. As that, of yesterday, uh, you're right. No, that's true. Is, uh, that's true. So as of yesterday, he's president-elect. So um, so president-elect. Um, uh, Biden is, has, is no different than any other politician that he says things during the campaign trail, which he which may be more extreme, uh, indicative of a direction, but more extreme. So and the other thing is what's going to happen in um, in this Georgia election. You know, if he controls the entire legislature, the House and the Senate, he can do a lot more things than he can um, clearly yeah. through um, executive order. Rustin, across the 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 sort of barrel as such can you give us a sense of update where is uh, your particular patch looking as we come to the end of imo 2020 the year that was <laughs> did it have all the whistles and bells that we were all expecting uh, how does it look as as we come to the end of that well i mean markets looked uh, look fairly uh, well balanced i think the biggest surprise to everybody at least from the shipping side is how strong heisel for fuel has actually been throughout the entire year. Uh, a lot of that is more driven by refinery dynamics and uh, scrubber ship demand. I mean, from the last count, ships of scrubbers is about 4,200 units out in the market working these days. You know, Singapore demand, it's about one third or one quarter of Singapore's demand is, is high sulfur fuel. Um, so it has taken its position in the market, but the fact that it's been a lot stronger than it really has is, uh, I think, uh, dampened a lot of the uh, enthusiasm around scrubbers back when it was a three hundred dollars spread. You know, we've been averaging anywhere between fifty to seventy dollars uh, a ton, uh, but it is starting to widen out. Uh, so I think that refinery dynamic of the appetite for high sulfur straight runs and as an alternative feedstock um, does outweigh a lot of the expectations the traders had. Uh, from a VLSFO standpoint, the market's fairly well supplied in that regards. I think uh, people are a bit surprised at how pervasive it has become throughout the entire market and that you can pretty much pull into any port and you can find 0.5 fuel. Uh, so a lot of the ideas that, oh, there'll be ports with no high sulfur, there'll be ports with no low sulfur, uh, that really didn't come to pass. So I think people were very effective uh, in distributing the, the molecules around the world and getting them in place. Uh, and so I can say, you know, from our point of view, we've had no problem getting coverage in different ports around the world. Uh, I think quality issues are the more dynamic uh, point that's happened. Uh, and I think that's a lot more based on the fact that VLSFO being a positive margin product has a lot more um, material that can go into it. And it gives a lot more different levers for a blender to use to create VLSFO. Uh, like when gasoline margins are crap and uh, refineries need to access VGO, they now have a place to put it versus slacking a crude unit. Um, so it does add a bit more dynamic, and that's been part of the reason why I think the it's been it's a been a far more interesting market than uh, I would have expected if it was just a plain Jane uh, refinery cut, not having all the other options available to make the fuel. Let's uh, go to the survey question of the week that we've been asking each day before we ask our speakers 
to sort of look in their crystal ball for the year ahead as to what are the big things to watch out for as this will be the last occasion this year that we will have the speakers join us. What will be the average price of Brent crude oil in 2021? That's the question of the week that we're trying to get our heads around. Maybe I should have included closer to $70, but I wasn't that bullish. Sorry, Rustin. Um, what is the answer in the room for that question? And then we'll go around the table to get a sense of, and as we're going around the table, you can see some of the promo flyers that uh, Irene is sharing on uh, the forum on January the 13th. Uh, lots of outlook for the year ahead on January the 13th. But today we'll do our own little version of that. Vandana, what do you think uh, one needs to keep an eye on for 2021? Would it look a lot different? Um, well, so three things, uh, vaccines, vaccines, and vaccines. <laughs> um, so, uh, so that's One like that's Pfizer, Moderna, and Sputnik V. AstraZeneca. Isn't it? Oh, okay. Well, if you say Sputnik V, you should also say Sinovac. Don't discriminate. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you know, or Sputnik V, as somebody well, said to me during the week. It's not five, it's V. Okay, sorry. Well, guess what? Uh, and not surprisingly, in Singapore, uh, Sinovac is going to be one of the choices of vaccines that's going to be offered. Um, of that's course, the Chinese be- one, right? Yes, it is. Yes, we have that one here as well. Okay, good. I think it's it's going to spread far and wide. I think uh, China has uh, promised a lot of countries, especially in uh, Southeast Asia and uh, Africa, Latin America. You know, that's vaccine diplomacy time for, for China. Um, I'm not sure I would go for Sinovac. Well, I haven't yet made up my mind. We're going to get vaccines here in Singapore starting next year. Um, and uh, definitely the government has said everyone will be covered by the end of the year. It's going to be free for all residents of Singapore. So, um, look, uh, you know, we, we all know what's happening with the uh, vaccines rollout in the, in the West. Uh, we know UK went first, we know Canada, US. Um, in Asia, you know, just for the, for the sake of our listeners who are probably more focused on the West, Um, I don't think it's as bleak as, oh, poor Asia, poor countries, uh, you know, a lot lot of them won't be able to afford. I think, in fact, a big surprise might await us there in terms of, uh, well, the Chinese are going to get vaccinated anyway. We know that. Uh, We know vaccination. uh, India is already making plans, putting in place uh, processes for, for vaccine distribution. So, Long story short, I think um, vaccine will get across to most part of a- parts of Asia. Uh, we do know that this region, in any case, has been recovering pretty well. Um, Chinese refining rates were hit a new all-time high in November. Uh, I was just looking at Indian demand in November was uh, back to 97% of uh, pre-COVID levels or last November's levels. So things are looking up uh, in Asia. Nonetheless, we will have a multi-speed world. I think we'll we'll have probably a, a, a bigger dichotomy between the, the vaccine haves and the have-nots. So that, that, that's something that will be... Uh, I think uh, one of the things important. one would pay attention to, I think, in China, which is, 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 is a note, even though COVID is pretty much eliminated, they're still at 95% mask wearing in public. And that's probably a discipline that helps a lot, despite whether vaccine rollout is bionic or not. Absolutely. Rustin... Your thoughts, 2021, what does it look like for you? Will uh, there be another IMO to get excited about? Well, 2030 is the decarbonization roadmap starting. So uh, that's already on the works and already uh, a lot of companies are focusing in energies around that. It takes up a bit of my day as well. Um, so that's, that's the next next roadmap, uh, our next stop on this road of uh, cleaning up the uh, emissions. Uh, I think in 2021, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting to see you know some of the different hot spots around the world how they how they shake out, especially with the change in the administration on January twentieth, uh, with Biden coming in. What are his policies going to do to impact the Middle East? Um, you know, namely, what's his stance actually going to be around Iran? Are we going to get them back into back into the uh, good graces of the world governments through uh, re-entering the uh, nuclear deal? Uh, I'll also be looking at the issues in northern Iraq. Uh, you know, PKG, KRG, uh, PKK and KRG are, are, you know, added again. So does that help disrupt flows? 
Um, and you know, I also think the uh, the Yemenis conflict is going to be something that's had to keep an eye on. Uh, there's Which a lot of, uh, the conflict between Saudi and Yemen. Yemen, yeah, right. Well, maybe David um, might comment on that. Let's get the survey result of that uh, first question. Uh, Seventy percent at fifty dollars. Um, the David, your thoughts of the year ahead, and I'd, I'd welcome your views on the geopolitics of the Middle East, particularly as related to, to Saudi Arabia, Iran, Saudi Yemen. There's a lot of fractures in the neighborhood. Will they get more pronounced in the year ahead or will they get more solved? And, and I guess, and the real question is, do they affect oil prices? And, you know, I don't really see that the struggle, the struggle, if you will, or the, the war in Yemen doesn't really affect uh, oil prices except perhaps for tanker shipments uh, through the, uh, the straits there, but uh, they, I don't think they're gonna close it. The, anyways, no, I don't think that the war in Yemen is, is, is a problem. I don't think the dispute with Qatar is a problem for oil prices and Saudi Arabia's human rights record doesn't really affect oil prices either. What does affect um, oil prices is the sanctions on Iran. Um, my feeling on that is that it's gonna be harder to lift those than people think. Yesterday, there were some 50, notable uh, diplomats and uh, former government officials who said that we should uh, accept uh, no, we should have no preconditions and just uh, rejoin the um, Iran nuclear deal. Uh, I think that would be hard to do. The Iranians have said they would do that. I, I, my own feeling is I think that'll be difficult. I think it'll be more difficult um, to just restart this thing uh, than people think. So I wouldn't see the, um, the Iranian sanctions being lifted in the for certainly in the first six months of the coming year. Um, David, in the last 18 or 18 months ago, when we saw some of the, uh, the sort of activities in the region where ships were attacked, where Abqaiq was hit in Saudi Arabia, uh, we saw a kind of an incremental increase in, in, in how those events occurred over six months with the culmination of the spectacular attack on Abqaiq. In the last month or so, we've seen a few pinpricks again, uh, and I'm wondering your own sense, Do you could you anticipate this similar trend as we saw 18 months ago? What's your analysis on that? Well, I think that they will continue, uh, but I would be surprised if we saw anything on the scale of Abcake. So I think that's what I think that I think it was a very clear signal sent that uh, another ab cake would 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 be responded to uh, that pin pin pricks are pin pricks and that they probably will go on responded to. So I, I would expect to see more pin pricks, not just in Saudi Arabia, but in Iraq as well. OK, let's get the survey question. The second one I have for today, which is about the, what I tackled with David earlier. If indeed Brent oil prices average $50 a barrel in 21, which has been the consistent uh, prediction uh, by the, the, the forum, uh, will we see shale oil once again surprising markets in its resiliency to recover? That's the question. We accept that oil prices, that's the forecast, $50 on an average for Brent. So will that result in shale oil once again surprising markets and its resiliency to recover yes or no is the view is what i'm looking for uh and then we'll go around the room for one last comment bandana one last thought about the end of this year crazy year that it's been can we all go away and celebrate christmas and forget about the markets or will they continue to distract us uh in the coming weeks do you think well, I think we should all go away and celebrate just for the sake of our sanity, yes. <laughs> Sean. <laughs> I certainly hope you do. Uh, yes. Look, I think, yes, 2021 is definitely looking up. Uh, if we didn't have such a, such a tremendously fast, speedy rollout of vaccines, perhaps uh, we, I would not have been sounding as optimistic. I responded closer to 50 to your first question. I think we had more bulls in the room when you asked this question and on your Sunday show, because I remember yeah. the result was 88% were closer yeah. to 50. And it seems to have split today <laughs> a little bit in, in favor of 60 and, and 40. So 50, I think. Um, to your second question on shale, um, look, it's coming back. Yes, the rig count has come up about, you know, 17 of, the of, of every 100 rigs that had gone away, uh, about 17 are back, which is a very, very small fraction, I would say. 
Uh, I don't expect a major rebound in, in shale, uh, even if Brent is around 50. Rustin, your final thoughts? Um, well, I think uh, the Santa Claus rally is is in effect. Uh, I think uh, once we see if the U.S. Congress can get stimulus uh, passed and enacted, that probably gives us the next big push up higher on crude prices. Uh, the one interesting fact about crude or about petroleum is that it is the laggard of investment categories. We look at it from a state of equities, gold, currencies. And so there is room for money flows to come in and keep pushing crude higher, even though the fundamentals may not support it, what everybody sees in the front face with the uh, COVID lockdowns and increased lockdowns. Um, so yeah, as we go to the end of the year, I hope uh, everybody on this call and everybody's uh, friends and families stay safe, stay healthy, and that we can all uh, celebrate in the new year. Well, let's get the survey result before giving David the last word. Um, 62% saying yes, that once again, shale will surprise in its recovery. David, the last word is with you. 2021, end of 2020. So uh, congratulations on your book. I see it on the shelf behind you. Just to acknowledge David wrote a very, very insightful book this year. Um, Saudi Arabia. Just when you when you asked about the price, are you talking about the beginning of the year or the end of the year? The average. It was the average for 2021. The average, the average for the average whole year. For, yeah, the average. The year. Okay. The yeah. average. All right. Um, the... Many of the shale uh, frackers relied on uh, venture capital, which is not coming forward at the pace that it did. And therefore I would not see them getting cheap financing to expand as quickly as they did in the past. And, there, and right now the rig count is, uh, is not adequate to expand uh, production quickly. Um, so I would not expect to see, and again, I'm talking about the first six months of the year. Yeah. I don't see the, um, the shale frackers expanding dramatically in that. Afterwards, I would say the long, so that's the short-term answer. The long-term yeah. answer is that the number of things that people do and come up with to reduce the cost of um, drilling is, it seems to be endless. I mean, every time you go, you find somebody who's come up with some new trick. I mean, when we started this thing in 2008, which is a long time ago now, uh, you know, people were saying it's gonna cost 70, $80 a barrel. Uh, it's half of that now, and we haven't exhausted all of the, I mean, at some point in time you may, but, uh, so I think that the frackers have a future. Um, yeah. Definitely. Uh, I, I, the other thing I would say just in my closing comment is that um, I sat in Midland many, many afternoons with people telling me about peak oil. And what they meant by peak oil then was peak production. And you probably remember these books, you know. Um, sure, yeah. Peak you know, supply. Uh, Twilight in the desert and all of this, you know. The, so they were talking about peak supply. Now they're talking about peak demand. And to, to be honest, I think that's a fairy tale, just like peak supply was. It's a, it may be real in Europe. It may be real in America. But the idea that there's peak, supply, peak, peak demand in Asia is, no. it, it seems to me, kind of far-fetched. Well, especially um, when you have one and a half billion Indians and one and a half billion uh, Chinese and they're only rising into the middle class, um, moving from motorbikes to Rolls Royces or whatever it is these well, days. Is, you know, this again, you, the, the, if you will, the chattering class seem to believe this in the West. But I yeah. just I, I think that that's very nice. I suppose you believe what you can see in front of you rather than what you cannot see. What, but we must okay. leave it there and acknowledge okay. everybody. Um, halftime talk this week with our, one of our regular commentators, Dr. Carol Knackley, giving her views on the year that was and the year that will be. As you can see, the wind is deciding that we're coming to the end of this season with the, my backdrops wanting to blow over. Uh, but we have one more session tomorrow, which will wrap us up for the year. But for today, thank you, Vandana. Thank you, Rustin. Thank you, David. Absolute pleasure to have you join us this season. And I look forward to all of you joining us on January 13th for the Outlook Forum. Uh, and that's encourage everybody to um, register, encourage your networks to register for that forum on our LinkedIn uh, page where it's accessible without charge. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful Merry Christmas. Snowing in Switzerland. I'm not sure humidity in Singapore, more of it. Uh, and David, uh, wherever you spend your season, best wishes to you. All Thank the best. You. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.